if you have any endurance left, if you have any strength to continue studying, after our long day in the vineyard working among the trees, then Jacob 6 is a fitting reward for you. After 77 verses in chapter, uh, chapter 5, you get a reprieve and just 13 verses in chapter 6, most of which build on what Jacob taught us with the help of Zenos from before. Okay, this will be Jacob's explanation. He gets the microphone back. He's just explained all of these things or, or quoted all of this. And now he wants to talk a little bit about it to make sure that we understood, that we didn't get lost in the weeds of the wild fruit. So he says in chapter 6, verse 1 and 2, Now behold, my brethren, as I said unto you that I would prophesy, behold, this is my prophecy that the things which this prophet Zenos spake concerning the house of Israel, in the which he likened them unto a tame olive tree, must surely come to pass. Now, I kind of chuckle there, because Jacob's like, I'm going to give you my prophecy. Oh, what is it? Well, my prophecy is that Zenos' prophecy is correct. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm grateful for the second witness. Jacob is living the allegory himself, after all. And so in some ways he's saying, I'm willing to trust in this. I'm willing to, to just lay hold of this promise because I am a branch cut off. I'm part of this group that was scattered to the nethermost part of the vineyard. Thankfully, it was not a poor spot of ground. It was a glorious one. And I'm, I get that. I'm grateful for it. But I've already lived to see the fulfillment of part of the tree going wild while part of the tree is trying hard to stay tame. What's going to happen if the negative overcomes the positive. That's what I'm trying to stop. It's what I'm trying to preach against. I'm trying to get us to become more equal and more one, even with our Lamanite brethren. So he says, the day that he shall set his hand again the second time to recover his people is the day, yea, even the last time, that the servants of the Lord shall go forth in his power to nourish and prune his vineyard. And after that, the end soon cometh. It's actually generous of Jacob to approach it that way. Like I just finished saying, he could have focused on his role in it all, because he's living it. But instead, he focuses on our role. The last days, you final servants, you better bring it all <laughs> to its glorious conclusion. All of us earlier trees and branches, are we're banking on you. We're relying on you. Our faith without your works is dead. So please have the faith to go to work on our behalf. Engage in the service. Dig and dung and weed and water and prune and plant and graft and give your heart and soul to this service of the Lord. We're in this thing together. Our future is, or our reality is wrapped up in yours. So roots and branches, can we get together on this? He says in verse 3 and 4, How blessed are they who have labored diligently in his vineyard. That's you and me, hopefully. And how cursed are they who shall be cast out into their own place, and the world shall be burned with fire. We get to choose which side we're on here. This is blessings or curses, and we're in the valley of decision. But remember this, Jacob wants us to know. How merciful is our God unto us. For he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches. He stretches forth his hand unto them all the day long. They are a stiff-necked and a gainsaying people. And gainsaying, I had to look up. In the 1828 dictionary that Joseph Smith would have, would have thought about, it means contradicting. It means denying. It means opposing. It's like, ah, oh, these people that just put their dukes up and fight back against God. These obstinate trees that refuse to be worked with. That's tough, but, he says, as many as will not harden their hearts shall be saved in the kingdom of God. So be willing. Put your dukes down. Quit fighting God. Let him prune you, even when it hurts. He's the gardener here. Let him dig about you. Let him dung you, despite the smell. Let him plant you wherever he thinks you're best suited to grow. And trust that when it's in a rough spot, he'll give you all the more nourishment to get you there. The way he says it in verse 5 and 6, 
Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I beseech of you in words of soberness. So I'm taking this super seriously. Go figure, this is Jacob after all. That ye would repent and come with full purpose of heart. Forget the allegory. Let's go straight into the moral sense of Scripture. You've got to change. You've got to repent. You've got to come and give it your whole heart and soul. Cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. And I love that. Cleave is an interesting word because it means it's opposite. I, it's, it's a weird word. Cleave means to cut in half. But cleave also means to stick to your other half in hopes of becoming one again. Maybe that's why it had to be the same word for both sides. Because it was meant to be one. The cleaving separated it, but as they cleave back together, oh, there's a unity, there's an equality, there's a oneness. And the fact that we are children of heavenly parents, no wonder we can cleave to God as he cleaves to us. The fall cleaved us in two. The atonement cleaves us in one. It makes us at one with God. So cleave to him. I've got a daughter, my middle one. My youngest is the one that gives me T-Rex hugs and and minion hugs, the one that are just baby arms. She doesn't stick them out. But her older sister is an even worse hugger than her. And she always laughs about this. She knows it. She owns it. But I'll just throw my arms around her, and she's just kind of this limp rag. And it's become a family joke. But it's like, why don't you hug me back when I hug you? And to think of God looking at us, why don't you cleave to me the way I cleave to you? I will not give up on these trees of the vineyard. Don't give up on me. Come, just let me love you. And everything will change. The way Jacob says it, while the arm of mercy is extended toward you in the light of day, harden not your hearts. That's as simple as that. Just yield to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and you'll end up putting off the natural man. Just submit, give in to your desire to be with God. Surrender to the better angels of your nature. Yea, today do it, Jacob says. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And then the ultimate rhetorical question, for why will ye die? <laughs> the question really is that simple. Do you want to die or do you want to live? Again, this is Moses. I have set before you life and death. Wherefore, choose life. Jacob just reverses it. Don't choose death. Why would you want that? We just saw 77 verses on what happens to a, a vineyard that isn't going anywhere. Why would you choose that for yourself? So verse 7, Behold, after ye have been nourished by the good word of God all the day long, Will ye bring forth evil fruit, that ye must be hewn down and cast into the fire? I mean, good in, but garbage out. Is that really what you want to do? Look at all that God has done for you. I love what Jacob's doing with the allegory. He is now sharpening the point and then making his point to all the Nephites around him and all the Latter-day readers that will someday get this book. Are we sensing ourselves as his target audience? Have we been nourished by the good word of God? All day long we have been. Then why on earth would we, would we settle for evil fruit? Jacob says, behold, will ye reject these words? Hope not. Will ye reject the words of the prophets? Hope not. Will ye reject all the words which have been spoken concerning Christ after so many have spoken concerning him? My father Lehi did. My brother Nephi did. Isaiah did at great length. Zenos did. I'm doing it now. Are you going to reject all of us and deny the good word of Christ and the power of God and the gift of the Holy Ghost and quench the Holy Spirit and make a mock of the great plan of redemption which hath been laid for you? Talk about being bombarded with incredible rhetorical questions. Is that what you're going to do? I mean, have you ever seen a plant spit out the water you're trying to give it? You ever seen roots kind of shrink back and reject the strength of the soil? 
You ever seen leaves shrivel up on their own volition to try to keep themselves from the, the light of the sun? No, plants are smarter than that. The question is, will we be? Why quench the Holy Spirit when it's beginning to burn within you? I see it sometimes in students, not as much in college, but in the seminary, I used to see it all the time. When you could really sense the Spirit enter the room and start to work on people. And some, you'd see tears in their eyes. You'd see light in their countenance. And others in the back, usually, you'd see them squirm in discomfort. Like, I do not want to give in to this still small voice. I don't want to feel again because it's just going to make me feel bad that I'm not living up to divine expectation. And it's stiff-arming the, the Spirit. It is quenching the gifts of God. <laughs> to douse that holy flame, why would you want to? Just submit. In verse 9, Know ye not that if he will do these things, that the power of the redemption and the resurrection which is in Christ will bring you to stand with shame and awful guilt before the bar of God? That's what Jacob was warning about back in 2 Nephi 9. Remember that phrase? My transgressions are mine. I never passed them over. I never repented of them. I spent my day denying God's word, denying God's power, denying God's gifts. I quenched the Spirit. And, and now the only thing I'm feeling is regret over that choice. Jacob says, according to the power of justice, for justice cannot be denied. You must go away into that lake of fire and brimstone whose flames are unquenchable and whose smoke ascendeth up forever and ever, which lake of fire and brimstone is endless torment. You really want to succumb to the three-headed monster even though Jesus already defeated it? You want to succumb to the second spiritual death when Jesus already overcame the first why will ye die? I already asked you. Why would you allow that to happen? Interesting play on words, by the way. He just said, will ye quench the Holy Spirit? And then speaks about flames of torment, which Joseph Smith described as regret, that are unquenchable. It's interesting. We're going to quench one thing or the other. You can either quench your guilt by repenting and listening to the Spirit's calls to change. Or you can quench that Spirit and let, again, quench one or the other, because one set of fires is going to keep burning. Is it the fire of the Spirit, the fire of faith, the cleansing fire of the gospel of Jesus Christ, or is it the fire of regret, of second-guessing ourselves, of wondering, why did I choose death when life was placed before me? What was I thinking? No wonder Jacob ends this chapter. And in a way, might have been tempted to end his book with these verses, 11 through 13. Oh, then, my beloved brethren, now that you've wrestled with the long allegory, your place within it, now that you've wrestled with the, the points that I've been making these last few verses, repent ye. Let me make the choice crystal clear. That's the option you should take. Repent. And enter in at the straight gate and continue in the way which is narrow until you shall obtain eternal life. This seems to be Jacob's summary of Nephi's sermon on the doctrine of Christ, right? Faith, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost. That's the gate. Stay in it. Stay on the path. Endure to the end and God will tell you ye shall have eternal life. This is a summary of what he said back in 2 Nephi 9. The keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel. He employeth no servant there, so just come. And then this beautiful summary of the whole thing. Oh, be wise. What can I say more? It really is that simple. It's not rocket science. Just be wise enough to see God's superior wisdom. Be wise enough to choose life over death. That should be a no-brainer. So what can I say more? That seems to be the best place to put the pen down, to drop the mic, to leave it in your hands in this valley of decision with as crystal clear a 
a choice before you as I could make it. Just be wise. Finally, he says, I bid you farewell until I shall meet you before the pleasing bar of God, which bar striketh the wicked with awful dread and fear. Amen. Awful, by the way, is one of Jacob's favorite words, remember. And it's that awful fear, that awful dread, that awful shame about the awful consequences of our sins that he's warning us against. And then the amen. Again, it seems like he's ready to call it quits. These plates have been small. Uh, my brother, when he gave them to me, told me to just write the heads of these things, and I've given you the best I've got. History, he told me, barely touch on that. Uh, it's leave the space for the things of God. Revelation, which is great. Prophecy, which is powerful. The, the most important things, and I really feel like I've given it to you. But then, he's still alive, like Moroni at the end. Like, I thought I was done, but I, hey, I'm still here, and there's still a little bit of plates, so I'll, I'll keep writing. And Jacob does the same thing with one final chapter. It's an interesting one because in some ways, it's one of his more historical. Chapter 2 and 3 were a historical chapter because he's preaching to Nephites that are starting to justify their sins. Uh, but... Five, and Well, five was historical, but in terms of prophecy, a prophecy that was great, not many greater. But then it's done. He's borne his testimony. It's finished. He's left it in our hands. Be wise. Choose life, not death. And someday I'll see you. Until then, I bid you an everlasting farewell. Well, I bid you a farewell that I hope isn't everlasting. I want to see you again. I hope we'll stick together after judgment. But then it's interesting because in some ways he has a later experience that forces him to pick up the stylus again and engrave one more chapter that is historical, that is experiential on his part. He hasn't talked about himself much and the experiences he's gone through. I think he's, Jacob's too humble for that. But I wonder, on the basis of what he just said in chapter 6, with all those wonderful rhetorical questions, like who on earth would choose death when life is placed before them? Why would you want to quench the Holy Spirit? Why would you deny God's Word, God's Spirit, God's power? And then it was like, oh, I actually met a guy who did. And I wonder if, based on what he ended chapter 6 with, no wonder he had to continue with chapter 7. Because Sherem, the first Book of Mormon's official antichrist, comes onto the scene and makes those rhetorical questions not so rhetorical. He gets people to question and deny God's word and God's spirit and start going down a path that ends with death instead of life. Who hath corrupted the trees of my vineyard? Well, here comes somebody who's doing exactly that. So thank you, Jacob, for giving us one more bonus chapter. Okay? When you get a chance to study Jacob 7 with Sherem and then compare it to Nehor in Alma 1 and then Korahor in Alma 30, these three great antichrists in the Book of Mormon, their approaches are different, though their goals are so similar. It's really interesting to, to cross-examine them all or to check them out together and compare and contrast. Now, to dive into chapter 7, let me tell you a story. As many of you know, I study anti-Mormonism, and it's given me the chance to read a lot of it, but also meet actual anti-Mormons that are bent on pulling us away from our beliefs. I met a young man like that in one of my own institute classes in Tennessee. He was a young adult, fit in perfectly, and was... Coming into class, in my, in, as I pictured it, oh, he's an investigator, he has some LDS friends, he's coming to institute because he likes it, oh, he'll probably get baptized by the end of the semester. That happened most semesters in institute. But after a few, like a month together, after class, he pulled me aside and said, bro, how can we talk? And I'm like, sure. I'm picturing him like, okay, I'm getting close to baptism, I still have a few questions. Well, I was surprised. Because we sat down together, just the two of us, and he said, okay, I'm going to cut to the chase. I'm an anti-Mormon. I feel called of God to rescue you Mormons from the delusion of Mormonism, and you, Brother Halverson, are my go-to guy. I mean, you're their teacher. They all hang on every word, and if I can save you, then we can save them. I kind of laughed to myself, and I thought, wow, I'm flattered. You think they listen to me? That's amazing. Uh, I don't think I have that much influence. But if that's what you're interested in, give it your best shot. 
And he's like, really? We can talk? I'm like, yeah. Because when he told me that, I immediately knew which scripture story I was living. The fact he said, I want to talk to you because you're a man of faith and influence. And if I can rob your faith, then I can leverage your influence. And that's exactly what Sharon was doing with Jacob. Oh, if I can take Jacob down, oh, there go the Nephites that he's trying to lead in different directions. So I was happy to talk with him because I know the, how the Jacob story ends. And if he was going to act the part of Sharem, as long as I could act the part of Jacob, then I knew I could not be shaken. That's Jacob's word, by the way. So let's watch the story unfold, because chances are you're Jacob in your own Sharem-like experiences too. Okay? So let's prepare for it. There's some game film. Verse 1 and 2. Now it came to pass, after some years had passed away, there came a man among the people of Nephi whose name was Sherem. Now, the fact he came among them lets us know that Sherem is an outsider. Maybe he's not a Nephite. It doesn't sound like one. He comes among the people of Nephi. So a, a non-Nephite, what, what does that leave him? Is he a Lamanite? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe it's someone the Lamanites have mixed with. Maybe it's a person from the indigenous populations that were already there when the Lehite colony first arrived. This outsider, though, is trying to infiltrate and get in to make some changes. It came to pass that he began to preach among the people and to declare unto them, here's his first discussion, that there should be no Christ. That's why we call him an antichrist, though he never claims the title. Okay? What he's doing is definitely anti-Christian. There's no Christ? Okay, I know who you are. And I think sometimes as we work with people, we need to know where do they stand on that? I see all kinds of people on the internet attacking the church over historical issues or doctrinal issues or social stands, and yet so many of them don't even believe in Jesus at all themselves. And then it's like, mm, is there a higher target they're aiming for? Is their attack on the church going to leave me not only a non-Mormon, but a non-Christian? I don't want to go there. But this outsider coming in to say there's no Christ, he preached many things which were flattering unto the people. And this he did, that he might overthrow the doctrine of Christ. So not only is there no Christ, there's no doctrine of Christ, or at least there's no Christian point to that doctrine. We've talked about this before, that in the fourth article of faith, which is the nutshell of the doctrine of Christ, no one can avoid that doctrine, but they can avoid the Christian component of it. Remember, faith is what everyone starts with. It's how they organize their life around some organizing principle. It's that faith in whatever object they chose that leads their repentance and then their immersion into that lifestyle. The repentance is the behaviors that grow out of whatever they chose for pole position. And then they commit to that lifestyle and then look for confirmation that that lifestyle was best. That's working down the fourth article of faith, right? But what's the most important component? It's faith in what? in the Lord Jesus Christ. No wonder my, my repentance will make me more like Him. I'm, my conversion is to Him, right? And so when Sherem comes in and says there's no Christ, he's taking out the object of their faith. All I have to do is replace it with something else. And there's no shortage of possibilities there. Pick whatever you will, but replace Jesus. And then everything else will naturally follow. Your behaviors will change. Your com commitment will shift. Your confirmation will come from other corners. And you're no Christian after that. Okay? Now, notice he's using flattering words. And that's, that's a phrase that comes up pretty frequently in Scripture. Flattering, not just like, oh, you look so nice in that dress. But flattering in terms of, I'm going to tell you exactly what you want to hear. I'm going to make things seem so easy on you. No hard sayings for me. So come and hear. What's what Paul warned Timothy about, about people having itching ears, heaping up teachers to their own lusts, people that will tell them exactly what they want to hear. Can you scratch it, right? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that feels good. There's no sin? Because if there's no Christ, I guess maybe we didn't need one. And if I don't need forgiveness, maybe it's because I haven't sinned in the first place and I can do whatever I want. That's closer to what Korahor is going to teach. But notice how Sherem does it. It's fascinating. 
Verse 3, he labored diligently, which he'd have to because Jacob is laboring diligently himself. This is going to be a tug of war between light and darkness. Okay, We're caught in the middle. Who will we respond to? But Sherem is laboring diligently that he might lead away the hearts of the people. That's what he's aiming at. I mean, the words will have to register in the head first, but what he's really aiming at is the heart. So often, as I've studied anti-Mormonism, it seems to pretend to aim for the head, when in reality it's the heart that it affects most. Insomuch that he did lead away many hearts, there it is again, his tricks are working, his target is receiving the, the poison and it's being changed, and he, knowing that I, Jacob, had faith in Christ who should come, oh yeah, he sought much opportunity that he might come unto me. That's where I knew what story I was living. If you felt targeted by someone who's trying to attack your faith, well, take it as a compliment. They must know you have faith. They must, know, they must fear your influence on others. And so, of course, they're going to try to pull you away. Look at what you're going to do to pull away others. Sadly, we see that happen all too frequently in the faith. And people that could have so much influence for righteousness end up pointing people in a different direction. And Sherem is hoping to use Jacob to do just that. In verse 4, notice where his power comes from. The source of his charisma he was learned, that he had a perfect knowledge of the language of the people. Wherefore, he could use much flattery and much power of speech according to the power of the devil. Oh, this is an intellectual charisma. Nehor's will be a physical charisma. He's physically strong. Sherem is intellectually strong. And it's interesting the way it's described. His learning, his education... No wonder he's going to pretend to aim to the head, for the head with what seems like rational argumentation, when in reality it's going to shame people and make them feel bad, so it's the heart he's really after. That's typically the case. Remember, the mocking fingers of the, of the, of the great and spacious building, that works on the heart. But if I can say things in just the right way, part of it's flattering words, saying what you want to hear, but part of it is words that are very unflattering to the faithful. Ooh, no wonder I don't want to be faithful anymore. I don't want those words to apply to me. I don't want to be the butt of those jokes. I don't want to be made to look irrational, not as learned as he is. Have you ever been made to feel stupid because of your faith? It happens all the time. And Sherem is the master of that because he's mastered their language. Now, on the one hand, might this be literal language? Like he's an outsider. He's coming among the Nephites, but somehow he learned their language. Maybe he, as he came in among the Lamanites and then started learning whatever language they spoke. I mean, here's Hebrew, here's Reformed Egyptian. They're getting it. And now I can, I can use that language against you. It's one possibility. Another possibility is I know how Nephites think. I know their scriptural language. Remember what Jacob was up against back in chapter 2. You guys are using the scriptures and resting them to your own destruction. You're trying to justify your own sins with some kind of biblical backup. And I wonder here if Sherem is like, ooh, what do they believe in? What do they know? And the better I can learn their language, the way they describe things, the things that they prioritize, I can use it against them. I've got to like, this is like secret agent. I've got, to, I've got to infiltrate myself in among the people so I can then start saying exactly the things oh, that would be most effective against them. I mean, who are the most popular and most persuasive anti-Mormons on the internet right now? It's not born-again Christians that are trying to take down our faith because we believe in a different Jesus, as they say. It's ex-Latter-day Saints who have a perfect knowledge of the language of the people and therefore know just what to say. And in fact, can use much flattery, make it seem like you'd be doing yourself and others a favor by leaving this, this horrible church that not only isn't true, but it's not even good. They're going to play upon emotion as well as intellect. It's amazing how learned they seem to be. 
They know so much about church history and they keep peppering me with things. And there's, I mean, whole long letters and extended podcasts and, and there's so much material out there. And gulp, it sure makes it seem like I'm in the wrong and they're in the right. And my best bet intellectually or even morally would be to jump ship and side with them. And they are having much success through the power of their speech. That's why when I started studying anti-religion, I realized it's anti-religious rhetoric that I need to focus on. Because rhetoric is the power of persuasion. It's how do I say things in such a way that it works upon you until you choose to back away from your beliefs. I couldn't tear you away from them. It's religion. It's faith. So I can't disprove it. I have to get you to deny it. What kind of language can I use for that? Okay. Verse 5, he had hoped to shake me from the faith. For all the reasons we just listed, a man of faith, a man of influence. Here's Sharam trying to weaken Jacob's foundation and then patiently waiting for the superstructure to fall down all around him. I'm just going to shake him, okay? Here's earthquakes in diverse places. Here's, here's the shaking of faith we see as one of the signs of the times of the latter days. So, shake the faith, notwithstanding, and I love that word because here's the pivot. Here's everything that Sharam's doing against Jacob. Well, what's Jacob doing for Jacob's sake? How's he staying strong amidst the shaking all around him? Notwithstanding the many revelations. And the many things which I had seen concerning these things. For I had truly seen angels. They had ministered unto me. And also I had heard the voice of the Lord speaking unto me in very word from time to time. Wherefore, I could not be shaken. That is one of my all-time favorite verses. When it comes to fortifying faith and overcoming doubt. You see what Sharon's after? He's trying. He's trying with all his might. Notwithstanding, so here's the obstacle that Sharam's going to have to overcome. Well, you're going to have to deal with the fact that I have seen angels minister to me. That I have visions and prophecy and revelation. In fact, why was I one of the original three witnesses of the Book of Mormon? Because I've seen the Lord. So say whatever you want about there being no Christ. I know him. And he knows me. Unshakable? Oh, yeah. I am founded upon the rock of my Redeemer. I dug deep. And my footings are firm. Right there with the chief cornerstone himself. Good luck trying to move me off. Because I'm not the foolish man that built upon the sand. Even the way Jacob says it, of I've heard the voice of God. Speaking unto me, very word, and then my favorite, from time to time. So this is an ongoing experience, not a one and done. This isn't some old memory, some vague recollection that I think I felt the Spirit once. No, I feel it all the time. It might not be continuous, but it's frequent enough repetition that from time to time, I'm reminded of why I hold this faith in the first place. I worry about those who don't have the voice of God from time to time. That have it so infrequently, they start forgetting that they've ever felt it to begin with. Again, the three shelves of Revelation past, present, and future. Shelf one is so dusty that shelf two is now completely bare. So no wonder shelf three becomes so overloaded with questions that you now think will never get answered because none are being answered now and you can't remember any times they were answered in the past. No wonder your shelf breaks, as they say. No wonder it's all come crashing down because you, you've forgotten that you ever heard the voice of God. You've started to explain it away and made it seem like it was mere elevated emotion. That was just my own Confirmation, confirmation bias speaking in my mind when, no, it, it was a power beyond yourself. And at the time, 
you knew that. To me, it goes back to, to Moses 1, when Satan comes right on the heels of Moses' grand epiphany, and, Mo, and Satan says to him, Moses, son of man, worship me. And Moses' response, it's like, Lucifer, your timing is lousy. I just got dropped off after my experience with God himself, and I had to be transfigured just to endure his presence. And you? I don't even need sunglasses for you. Where is your glory? To juxtapose light and darkness makes the darkness all the more obvious. To juxtapose faith and doubt, oh, the faith comes shining through. I remember. Thank you for the time to times where you have come through for me, God. Now, this was a different anti-Mormon than the one I just told you about, but I met all kinds in the Bible Belt. And this one reached out to me, and we had like a two-hour phone conversation on a Sunday night. And he was throwing all kinds of scriptures at me and stuff of this, and what about that, and all these questions. I mean, there's whole books out there of what to, questions to use to stump the Mormons, right? I've got a few on my shelf. Uh, and it's just, how do I attack Latter-day Saints? How do I push away the missionaries when they knock on my door? All, all of this stuff. Okay, there's a whole cottage industry out there. Well, this one anti-Mormon reached out, and we were talking, and, and he was unloading his arsenal on me. And I was responding and trying to answer questions. And I, I don't get defensive or offensive. It's, I, I outgrew that uh, post-mission. So I wasn't Bible bashing, and it was just, oh, I understand where you're coming from, and your doctrine leads you to suggest that that verse means that, and ours suggests this, and it's biblical interpretation, and all this kind of stuff, right? Historical context, all these kind of things. And... By the end, I, I, he just wouldn't give up. And so I finally asked him a question that I often use to end these kinds of conversations when they're going nowhere. I said, are you asking me questions because you want answers or because you want me to have questions? Because if you really want answers, I can keep doing this. Okay? But it doesn't seem like you do because you don't accept anything I do share and you just throw something else in my face. So it, sounds, it feels a little bit more like you're on the offensive and you, just, you have questions because you want me to have questions. In which case, I think we're done with the conversation because I don't have any of those questions. I've resolved them in my mind. Uh, but there's another thing, too. So that, that usually is like, okay, you're right. That's, guilty is charged. I, I don't, I'm not, this is not curiosity or interest on my part. I'm on the attack. I have an objective. Figures. But then I said to him, you know, to be honest, I think your timing is just is bad. Because you called me on a Sunday. And, I mean, I was here, I had some time so we could have this conversation, but Sunday, I went to church this morning, and it was awesome. I felt my faith fortified. In fact, it's the first Sunday of the month, which in our tradition is fast and testimony meeting. So, number one, I fasted and felt incredibly close to God through that self-sacrifice. And then I went to my church and heard so many of my fellow saints Bearing witness of the hand of God in their lives is glorious. God is a present part of our lives. It's a beautiful thing. And I felt that today. Also, this semester I've been teaching the Book of Mormon. And I am more intellectually engaged and spiritually converted than I've been in ages because I am fully immersed in the text. Every day I spend hours here. And so you attacking it? I said to him, maybe be patient, wait, hope that I get lazy in the next year or two, and then call me on a day where I can barely even remember my faith. And yeah, I'll probably be shakable then. But right now, I could not be shaken. And to me, that's the whole reason I named this, this podcast that to become unshaken because of the lives that we're living, because of the, the scriptures that we're studying, because of the voice of God that we're hearing. And doubt can be quenched because the Holy Spirit has not been. Do you understand what I'm saying with all of this? This is how we live the gospel in the face of opposition. This is what steadies us in the midst of a shaking world. This is the foundation in faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jacob had it in an incredible way. Sherem, bad timing and bad target. Well, notice what happens next. We catch a glimpse of their conversation 
starting in verse 6. It came to pass that he came unto me, and on this wise did he speak unto me. And remember, he knows flattering words. He knows just what to say. He's got an anti-religious rhetoric that is so well polished according to the power of speech and the power of the devil. Well, this is what he said. Brother Jacob, and there, brother. Mm, can you hear the sarcasm? Just see it dripping off his teeth, trying to ingratiate himself with Jacob. Break down the defenses by pretending to be on his side. Brother Jacob. I have sought much opportunity that I might speak unto you. I've been chomping at the bit. I just, what a, what a privilege is mine. I finally get to make your acquaintance. I've been looking forward to this day. For I have heard and also know that thou goest about much, preaching that which he called the gospel or the doctrine of Christ. It's like, man, you're a hard worker. You're out there magnifying your calling. And you're taking this stuff seriously, aren't you? I mean, this stuff that you call the gospel, the so-called good news. He's already calling it into question just the way he's speaking about it. Now, he gets a little bit more on the offensive, a little more obvious. Now, you have led away much of this people. So now I'm making you the bad guy. I'm not the bad guy. I'm doing what's right. Not only are you wrong, but you are doing wrong by, by the people that you're quote-unquote serving. You're leading them, but in the wrong direction. After all, these people that are following you, look around. They pervert the right way of God and keep not the law of Moses, which is the right way, and convert the law of Moses into the worship of a being, which ye say shall come many hundred years hence. And now behold, I share him, declare it unto you that this is blasphemy, for no man knoweth of such things, for he cannot tell of things to come. And after this manner did Sherem contend against me. Oh, there's so much there. So sly on Sherem's part. Oh, he's slick, all right. Let's take something true, like the law of Moses, and use it to keep people from something that is more true, like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's turn means into an end in and of themselves, and that will keep them from accomplishing the ends that they are meant to accomplish. Hmm. That way I can take something good and use it to keep them from something better. <laughs> I don't even have to use evil. I don't have to tempt them to sin. Other people will do that later on. But I can tempt them, I can tempt them to put a misplaced belief in in a, a signpost, make it turn the signpost into the ultimate destination. Stay right here. You see, think about what Lehi, excuse me, what Nephi was doing in teaching the law of Moses, preaching the law of Moses, but all through it, teaching of Christ and writing of Christ and prophesying of Christ and rejoicing in Christ, so our children would know to what source they must look for a remission of the sin, of sins. Yeah, we live the law. But we teach the deadness of the law so that they'll know their life is in Christ. We get it. But then Sherem is trying to reverse all that. Oh no, it's all these boxes you got to check. And as long as you check them, you're good to go. Can you see how that would lead to sin? And lead away from a need for a Savior? Who needs a Savior when you can put your sins on the head of this ox or this, this sheep and let it be consumed? The law of Moses is the ultimate get out of jail card. That's kind of how Laman and Lemuel took it, right? In terms of, we check the boxes on the ceremonial law, and it excuses us from having to live the moral law. Great. Who needs a savior with that? Again, has Sherem come in and learned enough of the scriptural language of the people that he can use it against them? Can he turn the tables and make... Jacob looked like the offender. Huh. Can he use scare tactics like the word blasphemy? Which if you know your Old Testament, if you've read your brass plates, that's serious. And you're the one who's seriously guilty of that serious sin. I've mentioned this before, but in rhetorical studies, they call it an ideograph which is a word that's vaguely defined, but it has so much cultural capital that if you can use it, claim it on your side, kind of trademark it, and then use it against your enemy, then you win. 
That word alone. Some people call ideographs God words or devil words. And blasphemy is a devil word. And he's just thrown it in Jacob's face. There are other devil words in our day. And yes, they get thrown at us constantly. And if they can get it to stick in someone's mind and like, oh, no, Latter-day Saints are this or they're that or your church is this or that. And whoa, I don't want to be a part of that then. I don't want to be guilty of blasphemy. Notice what else he does. He says that this being, this Christ that you're mentioning, that he hasn't come. You say he will, that's impossible because no one can know of things to come. What, what Sherem is doing there is to attack the entire epistemological model that Jacob's been building upon. Epistemology, study of knowledge. How do you know? How do you know there's going to be a Christ? Going to be. That's future tense. You can't know of things to come. So let me knock out what you claim to be knowledge by saying there's no way you can know that. And I see ex-Mormon, anti-Mormons doing that constantly. What do you mean you say that? Well, because you felt the Spirit. Whatever. That's just elevated emotion. It's just self-induced kind of feeling there. It's confirmation bias because you want it to be true. You can't know from the Spirit because there's no such thing. You got some dopamine dump in the brain. It's just brain chemistry because you wanted it to be true. And sherems are alive and well and aplenty out there. Still trying to shake people from their faith. So yeah, you can't know any of that. But notice what Jacob says in verse 8 and 9. But behold, the Lord God poured in his spirit into my soul. Yeah, that wasn't self-induced. This isn't just my own confirmation bias. God, an outside source of strength, poured his spirit into my soul, insomuch that I did confound him in all his words. Confound, by the way, literally means to pour together in order to mix something up. So it's funny that God would pour in his spirit so that Jacob could pour out some questions and thoughts to Sherem that would end up confusing him. Notice, by the way, there's a difference between confounding in verse 8 with contending in verse 7. Sherem just wants to fight. He wants to contend. Jacob, that's, he's non-confrontational. Maybe that's why, why it was so hard for Sherem to find him. He kept trying to avoid this kind of confrontation. But here, it's unavoidable. Fine, let me confound what you're trying to do. I said unto him, deniest thou the Christ who should come? I just want to make sure that we're on the same, make this crystal clear for everyone. For each other, as well as all the hearers out there. How do you feel about Christ? And Sherem said, if there should be a Christ, I would not deny him. See how he's insinuating? I'm an honest person. Give me the evidence. I'll take it. But there isn't one. If there were, fine. You're right. I'll, let me join you. But I know that there is no Christ. Neither has been, nor ever will be. Well, how's that for... Testimony against testimony. He said, he said, you say you know there's a Christ because you've seen him? Well, I know there isn't because I haven't. And I never will. In fact, you haven't either. There's this sense of nobody can know. I know, but you can't. My epistemological model works. Yours doesn't. So you have to accept my knowledge and accept the basis of my knowledge. Why? Why, why, do we, why do I have to do that? In fact, you've already... There's a problem in your so-called epistemological model because you already said you cannot know of things to come. And yet, what did you just bear testimony of? No one will ever know a Christ. He will never exist. Wow, didn't you just foretell the future? thought you said we couldn't do that. If no one can know what will be in the future, why do you claim to know what won't be in the future? There's actually a hilarious line from Flannery O'Connor, wonderful Catholic writer in the early 20th century, just a novelist, but she once kind of cracked at atheism and said, you know what, to be a real convinced atheist, you'd have to know everything. Because to fully know that there is no God, you'd have to know everything that does exist. It's like you'd have to have a complete inventory of the universe 
and then check everything on the list. And if God isn't on the list, then now you can be a proven atheist because, yep, I know everything and God isn't out there. So, boom, there you have it. But then she kind of twinkled in her eye and said, but that level of omniscience, of knowing everything, only God has that. Hmm. So I guess only God could be an atheist. <laughs> but he believes and has his reasons to. I always chuckle with that. God is no atheist. God is all-knowing, and he knows himself. And so those who claim to know there can be no God, I'm okay with agnosticism. Agnosticism at least has a humility about itself that I, I don't know. I don't know if you know, but I, I don't know what I know, and I don't know if anything we can know. It's, it's a humble epistemology. Can we, can we really know anything? Well, I would say yes, but at least you're not saying that you know that it's false. And if you could be humble in your agnosticism, maybe I could be more humble in my faith and just allow you to come to an understanding instead of me trying to force feed you my testimony and probably make you force feed me your lack of one in return. Okay, I'll, I'll handle that. I'll take the agnosticism. But this kind of militant anti-Christianity, there can be none. And I know that. There never will be. But, back to Jacob, verse 10, I said unto him, Believest thou the Scriptures? I mean, after all, that's where we learned the law of Moses. So, you seem to know these words. You have a perfect knowledge of that language. Do you actually believe them, though? And Sherem said, Yea, you better believe it. Well, that's where I got all this stuff. Okay, fine. Jacob, I said unto him, Then ye do not understand them, for they truly testify of Christ. This is like what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You search the scriptures because you think that in them ye find eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. Which means you claim knowledge of scripture, but you don't have understanding of them. You've missed the point of what the law of Moses was pointing to. So Jacob says, Behold, I say unto you that none of the prophets have written nor prophesied, save they have spoken concerning this Christ and this is not all. It has been made manifest unto me, for I have seen and heard. And it also has been made manifest unto me by the power of the Holy Ghost. I wonder if he's saving the strongest for last there. The Spirit even outweighs the evidence of the senses. But I've got those two. I've heard the voice of God. I've seen things. I've seen visions. I've seen the ministry of angels. I've seen the Lord. And best of all, by the power of the Holy Ghost, these truths have been woven into the fibers of my soul. I know these things. That's what he says. Wherefore, I know. And I know if there should be no atonement made, all mankind must be lost. And that sounds like Jacob too. Without the righteousness of my Redeemer, then there's no redemption. And salvation that's freely offered by him, can no longer be free. Without him to conquer the three-headed monster, then we become prey to that monster and, its, and the awful consequences of our sins. I know my own human weakness, Sharon. I don't know if you know yours. Your charisma has gone to your head your learnedness, your intellectual arrogance has led to a spiritual pride where you think you're the top of the, the food chain with no God above you, at least no Christ. But I know better. I know myself better than that. I know my own human weakness. And what is the solution to sin and death? It can't simply be the law of Moses. Oh, if the, book, if the book of Hebrews had been written by then, I think Jacob would have quoted the whole thing. It can't be the blood of oxen and sheep that saves us. It's, this is just pointing forward to something better, to someone better, and that someone is Christ. I know that. I know him, and I know me, and I know how much I need him. So from there, verse 13, Sherem interrupts. It came to pass that he said unto me, Show me a sign by this power of the Holy Ghost, in the which ye know so much. There's more sarcasm dripping. You know this, huh? 
You know so much more than I do. You have this power, this holy ghost. Well, scare me with it, will you? <laughs> Jump out and boo, show me a sign. Prove it. Use my epistemological model, but use some of yours to lean into it. Meanwhile, humble Jacob says to him, what am I? And not even just who am I. <laughs> He's lowering himself even beyond who down to what. I'm just a creature and I'm not going to command the creator. So what am I that I should tempt God to show unto thee a sign in the thing which thou knowest to be true? That's interesting. I don't have to convince you. You just need to stop deceiving yourself. You know what you're made of. You know what need you have. You know, well, something about the law of Moses, but you've got to know its insufficiency. You, you know more than you're letting on. Yet thou wilt deny it, Jacob says, because thou art of the devil. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but if God shall smite thee, let that be a sign unto thee that he has power both in heaven and in earth, and also that Christ shall come. And thy will, O Lord, be done, and not mine. Humble Jacob leaves it all in the Lord's hands. I'm not trying to flex my own prophetic muscles. I'm not trying to counter your charisma with some kind of misplaced charisma of my own. No, I'm just going to leave this in God's hand. And he can do whatever he chooses to. I'm not asking him to vindicate me and my authority. I'll let God speak for himself. That's how much confidence I have in him. For us, do we have that much confidence in the spirit? That we can simply share what we know and, or what we feel, share what has made a difference in our lives, our beliefs, and just leave it at that? And if you choose not to accept it, that's okay. Not, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to contend even though you seem to be wanting to contend with me, I'll let the Spirit either confirm these things or not, depending on whatever you're ready for, because I trust God's will in all of this, including His power, process, and pace. But notice what happens in verse 15 and 16. It came to pass that when I, Jacob, had spoken these words, oh, it happened, the power of the Lord came upon Sharem, insomuch that he fell to the earth, and it came to pass that he was nourished for the space of many days, which is interesting. He just got the sign, just like he demanded, but it wasn't the kind of sign he would have wanted, right? He just like, you prove it. And, and Jacob's like, well, there's a lot of ways to do it. I'll let the Lord decide, but smiting you, is that going to be enough? You want to be, you're trying to victimize us. Do you, are you willing to become a victim? This might be one of those examples of enforced empathy we kept talking about in our Old Testament study. You, you don't care about what other people are feeling as they lose their faith. Do you want to you want to feel what it feels like? You want to feel like what? Okay, here, here it comes. But what's interesting to me is the fact that they nourish him. It's not a neener, neener, rub salt into the wound. It's now do you understand? I'm sorry it took that. I, I'm sorry it went to that level. But there's hope for you. We have hope for you. So let us nourish you even though you were trying to poison us. This is love thine enemies. This is pray for those who use you and, or despitefully use you and persecute you. It's interesting what Jacob is doing to this former enemy that he never felt as an enemy. Just, you called me brother Jacob? I don't think you meant it, but I'm willing to see you as brother Sherem and nourish you back to health if that's the Lord's will. Well, it ended up not being that. Despite their best efforts, next verse, it came to pass that he said unto the people, gather together on the morrow, for I shall die. He knew that's what would happen. In fact, how's that for knowing the future? Wherefore, I desire to speak unto the people before I shall die. Their Sherem finally wants to use his gifts of language in a positive way. I've come to my senses I've experienced something that I cannot explain away. I've realized just how reliant I have to be on a higher power because I have no power myself. No power to 
overcome mm. the sins that I now feel deeply I'm guilty of and no power to avoid the death that is staring me in the face. Boy, do I need a savior. But I've said there is none. What's the law of Moses going to do for me right now? That's not where real nourishment is going to come from. So, verse 17, it came to pass that on the morrow the multitude were gathered together. And he spake plainly unto them. Oh, no more sophistry, no more flattering words, just plain truth. He denied the things which he had taught them and confessed the Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost and the ministering of angels, which is an interesting trio, especially that last one. It's one thing to recognize there has to be a Christ and I need him desperately. This is what you'll end up like without him. No way to overcome sin, no way to overcome death. The other, the power of the Holy Ghost, wow, Jacob's epistemological model actually works. What I'm experiencing, believe me, is not self-induced because I would never induce this. This isn't confirmation bias because it's confirming something I was biased against. Not in favor. And again, that third one, the ministering of angels. Maybe it wasn't just human hands that were trying to nourish him at the end. He's bearing witness of all of those things. And he spake plainly unto them that he had been deceived by the power of the devil. And that's the problem. We end up deceiving others when we first allow ourselves to be deceived. But now he sees things crystal clear and wants to make sure they do too. So he spake of hell and of eternity and of eternal punishment, which is what he fears he is now facing. Sharon gets it. He wants to make sure we get it too. And then verse 19, he said, I fear lest I have committed the unpardonable sin. Interesting language, because without the atonement, then every sin would be unpardonable. Even the most minor. No way to get around them. In Sherem's case, I fear it's unpardonable, for I have lied unto God. For I denied the Christ. I said that I believed the scriptures, and they truly testify of him. I'd been using one part of the scriptures to deny the main message of scripture. I'm so sorry. Because I have thus lied unto God, I greatly fear lest my case shall be awful. That's, again, one of Jacob's favorite words. But I confess unto God. And what's interesting there is, just like Jacob, Sherem is leaving it in the Lord's hand. Maybe, maybe there's hope for me. When he says, lest my case shall be awful. I don't know. Maybe this isn't unpardonable. Maybe Christ, who I now proclaim, would be willing to forgive even me. Maybe I can avoid hell and eternal punishment after all, because there is a Christ, and I desperately need him. But with that final witness of Christ on his lips, it came to pass that when he had said these words, he could say no more, and he gave up the ghost. And when the multitude had witnessed that he spake these things, as he was about to give up the ghost, oh, they were astonished exceedingly, insomuch that the power of God came down upon them, and they were overcome that they fell to the earth. Those phrases should ring a bell, by the way. Go back to verse 15, and what happened? Back in 15, Sherem felt the power of the Lord, and he fell to the earth. He then pays it forward bears his witness to those all around them, and they now feel the power of God and fall to the earth as well. It's interesting that here at the end of the book of Jacob, who's the one that we have to thank for a Nephite ref, uh, re renewal of faith? Sherem. Hmm. Maybe that's why we pray for our enemies, because if they can change, they might be more successful at changing those that were like-minded. To love our enemies until they're no longer enemies, and then they can help. 
friends be friends again. You understand? To me, it's incredibly humble on Jacob's part that it wasn't just call down the fires of heaven and, and strike a blow and then he kind of dances on Sherem's grave. No, he's, they're out there nourishing him. And when the final testimony is born, he allows it to be Sherem's. Not an I told you so, but I'm going to let him tell you so. What did he learn? And let his testimony ring in the people's ears. In verse 22, now this thing was pleasing unto me, Jacob, for I had requested it of my father who was in heaven. For he had heard my cry and answered my prayer. I let Sharam's testimony do what mine can't. I've tried, I've borne witness, and yet all this success that Sharam had came at the expense of Christ. But I'll let Sharam have one last redemptive act. I even wonder if that phrase, he gave up the ghost, that's a phrase we usually associate with Jesus, and here it's used to describe Sharam. Was that the moment of his redemption as he's trying to redeem those that he led astray? Give him a chance to change, to prove his change for his sake, not just for the sake of the people. I love that about Jacob's humility in all of this. And as a result, he says, it came to pass that peace and the love of God was restored again among the people. And they search the scriptures and hearken no more to the words of this wicked man. I love they go back to what Sherem had been teaching them. They saw the scriptures, but it's like, oh, okay, I see what he did there. How did I get duped? I've got to know the scriptures as a whole, not just so somebody cherry picks verses and makes things look bad. We might need to do that with church history. I need to understand the whole story because people keep cherry picking stuff and throwing it in my face and I freak out over every, every one. Now go back and it's like what Rick Turley always used to say. Don't study church history too little or somebody's going to be able to throw something in your face that freaks you out. Study the whole thing. Another anti-Mormon said that to me. You Latter-day Saints are banking on the... You don't want your members to, know, to learn their history. Because as soon as they learn their history, they're out. And I responded, well, I can see why you'd say that. But I actually think it's you that doesn't want our people to learn enough of our history. You want them to learn just enough, they start freaking out. But not the rest to get their feet back underneath them. You're being very selective. Whereas the whole context will allow us to handle the messy parts. Here, search the scriptures. Turn back to them and what will result once you see them as a whole, as they point you forward to Christ? Oh, peace and the love of God. And I actually love the grammatical error here because if peace is one thing and love of God is another, those are two things. So you've got plural nouns, you need a plural verb. It should say peace and the love of God were restored. (laughs) But the fact they kept it with a singular, I actually like that. Because the singular verb would suggest those, I guess those are singular nouns. Or a, or synonymous nouns that make them one. The love of God, that is peace. And peace, that is the love of God. Bring it, bring both, bring both on. (laughs) Okay, give me, give me both. Give me, give me it, since it's the same thing. In verse 24 then, it came to pass that many means were devised to reclaim and restore the Lamanites to the knowledge of the truth. I mean, the Nephites that were struggling because of Sherem, now they've been reclaimed thanks to Sherem's final testimony. But we've been trying those kinds of things with the Lamanites left and right, and none of it's worked. It all was vain. For they delighted in wars and bloodshed, and they had an eternal hatred against us, their brethren, They sought by the power of their arms to destroy us continually. Wherefore, the people of Nephi did fortify against them with their arms and with all their might, trusting in the God and rock of their salvation. Wherefore, they became, as yet, conquerors of their enemies. I bet those verses were hard for Jacob to write. Because our brethren, yeah, they really are for him. And yet, it seems like their hatred toward us is eternal. What will it take to change that? I don't know. Well, it will take peace and the love of God to do that. It will take the power of the Spirit. In the meantime, sadly, we have to 
wield the power of the sword to defend ourselves against their attacks. We will not go on the offensive. Notice Jacob never went on the offensive with Sherem. Sherem came to him. But Jacob did defend the faith. And here the Nephites are defending themselves. The one thing they do want to go on the offensive with, though, is the sword of the Spirit and the Word of God. It's just not working yet. Jacob has faith that someday it will. So he says in verse 26, And it came to pass that I, Jacob, began to be old. And the record of this people... Notice, I'm not going to be around to preach much longer, but the record is here. That's what can outlive us. That's what can outlive the obstinance of the Lamanites. This record, ah, yes, the record of this people being kept on the other plates of Nephi, wherefore I conclude this record. Remember, there were two sets. He limited himself. He confined his calling to the part he was supposed to move forward with. He was okay with the, thing he, the things he left undone because other people were assigned that. But here he's going to conclude it. I conclude this record, declaring that I have written according to the best of my knowledge. And that's good of Jacob to admit that. It's probably not perfect, but it's the best I could do. And he's content with that. But he's going to end it by saying that the time passed away with us, and also our lives passed away, like as it were unto us a dream. We being a lonesome and a solemn people, wanderers, cast out from Jerusalem, born in tribulation, in a wilderness, hated of our brethren, which caused wars and contentions, wherefore we did mourn out our days. That is such a melancholy summary of a difficult time of life, a difficult stage in their history. He knew which scene in Zenos' allegory he was living in, and it was a rough one. But what's interesting there is it seems more than historical for his people. It seems very personal for him. That's as close to an autobiographical sketch of Jacob that you could see anywhere. We were born in tribulation. That's exactly what Dad said about you, Jacob. You're the, the firstborn in my years of tribulation. Wanderers in a wilderness? <laughs> Those were your first years of life. You learned to walk on desert sand. When it spoke of being hated by their brethren, you felt that hatred up close and personal when you saw what Laman and Lemuel wanted to do with, to your brother Nephi and your father Lehi. That you had to be safe behind Nephi's wings. To be lonesome and solemn and wander, to be cast out and hope that you weren't cast off. That's Jacob's life to a T, and it's the experience of his people. No wonder he had great anxiety, and no wonder he needed so much faith. To understand the heart and soul of this incredible man, I'm grateful for what he's given us. Not only these past two weeks in his own self-titled book, but what he taught us earlier in 2 Nephi 6 through 10. I love Jacob. I always will. I'm grateful he was willing to push through these difficulties. But I also am grateful for his honesty in his anxiety. Now, even so, it even sounds like depression alongside his anxiety once you read that last, th those last verses, right? But what's interesting is... As Latter-day Saints, yes, men are that they might have joy, but it should be real joy that grows often out of real sorrow. It's the full range of human emotion, and understanding the, bit, the bitter allows us to prize the sweet. In the, book of, uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's a, an entire book called Lamentations. And Jacob's near contemporary Jeremiah was the one who wrote it, and boy, did he have things to lament about, and he did. He gave vent to those feelings, and we canonized them. To me, to me there's something powerful about canonizing our, our lamentations, sanctifying our tears as they mingle with those of a God who weeps, a Lord of the vineyard who grieves over his trees. I'm totally content to let Jacob 
share those emotions and mourn out his days. Even though there are periods of joy as well. With that, he then ends this book. And with this, we'll have to say goodbye to this incredible prophet. Verse 27, I, Jacob, saw that I must soon go down to my grave. Wherefore, I said unto my son Enos, who we'll meet next week in a shorter version, I said unto my son Enos, take these plates. Here we get another clear passing of the baton to make sure that they're not lost in the relay. I told him the things which my brother Nephi had commanded me, and he promised obedience unto the commands. So there's a successful passing of the baton. Do you understand what you're supposed to do with these? Do you know Nephi's thesis statement in 1 Nephi 1 verse 20? Do you know his thesis statements in 1 Nephi chapter 6? Do you understand everything he told me in Jacob chapter 1 verses 1 through 4? Are you getting this, son? And Enos says, yes, sir. I've got it. Well, with that, Jacob can now fully rest in peace. And he does. I make an end of my writing upon these plates, which writing has been small. And to the reader I bid farewell. Remember, he'd bid farewell at the end of chapter 6, but here he's doing it again, having walked us through the story of Sherem. Let me now, though, say goodbye a final time. Farewell, hoping that many of my brethren may read my words. I won't be alive to give them to you, but I hope those words will bring me back to life for you. They have for me. I'm grateful for his words. And then his final two. Brethren, adieu. Which, of all the things anti-Mormons jump on, this is one of my most treasured words. They want to jump on this and say, Jacob didn't know French. I'm like, duh, do you know 19th century English? Do, really? You're going to... I'm sorry, I shouldn't be dismissive. We love our sherems. We let them bear testimony once they come to themselves. But for those who want to attack the Book of Mormon, and Joseph Smith particularly, by saying, Joseph, what are you thinking? Why, on, I mean, you, you showed your hand there by using a word that never would have come from Jacob's lips. He didn't know the word adieu. In fact, I'm surprised Joseph did. You barely speak English. Where did you learn French? Well, Joseph didn't know French, but he knew that word. And in fact, guess where else the word adieu appears? In Webster's 1828 American Dictionary of the English Language. So adieu somehow got into English and even into American. If we want to use that as a separate tongue, the Brits probably want. Yeah, you keep it to yourself. But adieu is really fascinating because according to the dictionary of Joseph Smith's day, Listen to the definition. Adieu means farewell, an expression of kind wishes at the parting of friends, a farewell or commendation to the care of God as an everlasting adieu, which is exactly what Jacob's doing there. I don't know what word he would have used in Reformed Egyptian. But I just picture a young Joseph wrestling with that last term, like, well, I haven't, I've never seen this one. What is this? Jacob was more unique in his vocabulary than most any other Book of Mormon prophet. He had a different, uh, again, his own rhetorical gifts, his own literary mastery, and words he chose in, with a, a certain emotional valences uh, powerful. We've seen so many of them in his writings. But this last one, the last word he gives us, in some ways, is his masterpiece. A word that there is no English equivalent. So here's Joseph looking at the Reformed Egyptian like, what on earth is this? There's a depth of emotion here. There's this sense of commending his readers to God. There's a love and a depth in in. Jacob's heart, but he just wants to pull out his heart and give it to his readers and, and then hand it all over to God and let God's will be done. What, how do I even say that? Uh, see you later. Peace out. Uh, ciao. I'm out of here. Even goodbye has lost too much because goodbye in Old English, that was closer. 
because the good was from God and the by, B-Y-E, was from bless ye. So in Old English, goodbye meant God bless ye. That's a great way to say goodbye to someone. That's God be with you till we meet again. And the only time we'll meet again is in God's presence. So until then, goodbye. If we meant that when we said goodbye, if we started listening, hearing God be with you till we meet again, playing in the background of our farewells, oh, they'd probably be more tear-filled. We'd probably love each other more. and have a harder time saying goodbye, but a greater reunion when all is said and done. It's a beautiful word. Well, we've lost that over the years in English. In Spanish, how do you say goodbye? Well, adios. But pause and think about where we get that. Because a is actually a preposition. It means to. And Dios is a noun that even most non-speakers know. Not non-Spanish speakers. That means God. So a Dios literally means to God. And guess what adieu means in French? Those Romance languages have some common roots. And a Dieu means literally to God. Now, adios and adieu have lost some things in Spanish and French in the meantime, just like God bless ye and goodbye have in English. But for an early American, not knowing any French, but somehow the French stuck with a, an emotional valence that no other term really conveys, I can't think of anyone in the Book of Mormon using a word like that but Jacob. Joseph Smith didn't get this wrong. He got this incredibly right. Well, my friends, I guess that's adieu from us for this week. I pray that you are with God as you go. And pray that especially as we come to the conclusion of a four-year cycle of incredibly long lessons, again, maybe this is a, the best place for for me to convey that kind of love to all of you. This isn't goodbye. We'll be back next week. Again, be patient with me. I'm sure I'll mess up and be still too long-winded and I'll whittle it back and I'll have to skip a lot more stuff and I'll, I'll probably give you some homework assignments, some things to study on your own since I won't be able to walk you through them all. I'll try to link all of the old videos to the new ones. So if you want to just go straight from this onto old stuff, then you'll have it right there. It's all on the, the Unshaken YouTube channel. And so you can see everything we've ever produced. But, but this is goodbye for the long terms, the, the long haul, four or five hour lessons. Uh, again, thank you for enduring it well. Thank you for allowing me to, to share things that matter most to me. And to reach into my soul and hand over a piece of my heart. I hope you feel that. When I get to meet you out in random places, I feel your love for the Lord. And I pray you've felt my love for Him and for you through all of these years of Scripture study together. My dear brothers and sisters, bless you. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. And before bidding you a final adieu, let's do our quick review of Jacob 5 and 6 and 7. There's so many good one-liners here. Okay, so pause the farewell and let's review. I will prune it and dig about it and nourish it. Young and tender branches. It grieveth me that I should lose this tree. Watch the tree and nourish it according to my words. These will I place in the nethermost part of my vineyard, whithersoever I will. Come, let us go down into the vineyard, that we may labor in the vineyard. Counsel me not. I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. Gather it, and lay it up against the season, that I may preserve it unto mine own self. Let us prune it, and dig about it, and nourish it a little longer. It profiteth me nothing, notwithstanding all our labor. I know that the roots are good, except we should do something for it to preserve it. The Lord of the vineyard wept. 
What could I have done more for my vineyard? These I had hoped to preserve. I have stretched forth mine hand almost all the day long. Who is it that has corrupted my vineyard? Is it not the loftiness of thy vineyard? They grew faster than the strength of the roots, taking strength unto themselves. Spare it a little longer. Preserve unto myself the roots, the branches of their mother tree. I may yet have glory in the fruit of my vineyard. Pluck not the wild branches from the trees, save it be those which are most bitter. Trim up the branches because of the change of the branches, that I may have joy again in the fruit of my vineyard. Go to and call servants that we may labor diligently with our might, the most precious above all other fruit. Clear away the bad according as the good shall grow, that the root and the top may be equal the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. They did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. Ye shall have joy with me because of the fruit of my vineyard. And how blessed are they who have labored diligently in his vineyard. How merciful is our God unto us, for he remembereth the house of Israel, both roots and branches. Cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. Harden not your hearts, for why will ye die? Oh, be wise, what can I say more? He could use much flattery and much power of speech. Wherefore, I could not be shaken. The Lord God poured in his spirit into my soul. None of the prophets have written nor prophesied, save they have spoken concerning this Christ. If there should be no atonement made, all mankind must be lost. Thy will, O Lord, be done, and not mine. Peace and the love of God was restored again among the people. Trusting in the God and rock of their salvation, our lives passed away like as it were unto us a dream. We did mourn out our days. Brethren, adieu. That is the ultimate place to end this lesson, this chapter, this book, and this four-year experience together. Before we move on to another four years or however many years the Lord allows us to do this. Like I said, I am so honored to know you, to serve you, to teach you, and to learn from you. I'm grateful for your goodness and your kindness. I'm grateful for the love of the Lord that we share and the kindred spirits that we've become as we've feasted together on the words of God. I am grateful for their goodness and their power. I'm grateful for the fruits they produce in us. Talk about incredible roots we get to, we get to draw from week after week after week. With that in mind, and knowing that we'll be together again just a week from now, though in different circumstances and surroundings, may I again express to you my love and my faith and say to all of you, brothers and sisters, Adieu.